All right, class, I'm going to talk to you about chapter three and the role of the church in medieval Europe. This is not your textbook. Um, this is actually the online uh, history book that I gave you in Clever, but it does talk about the Crusades. So I just wanted to pull it up. It is actually page 117 for you guys. And then it talks uh, a little bit about England in the Middle Ages, but primarily here gave us some information about the Crusades um that i wanted you to be able to see again your use your textbook i just couldn't pull it up for the lecture so anyway you have something to look at um, but listen and take notes we've already talked about uh christians and christianity and how it kind of got started and um but what i didn't don't think i mentioned to you was that um it was the roman emperor constantine who actually allowed Christians to start to practice freely. And that was the year 395 CE, um, so in the Roman Empire. And that was kind of a big deal because of course, when people started to become Christians, they were persecuted. Um, remember that during this time, well, anytime, when somebody has a new idea or, idea or a new way of thinking, people are often threatened by that. And if it was going to mean religion, it was going to mean power, you know, that was definitely not going to be well accepted during the Middle Ages. Um, but after the fall of Rome, it was those monasteries, the people and the monks in the monasteries that really kind of kept the religion going until it finally was picked up by Clovis um, to be spread further into the Roman Empire. And then finally, of course, Charlemagne, who was the guy who, um, actually made really united uh, the Roman Empire with Christianity. Um, but anyway, um, remember the monks were the ones that, you know, preserved the old text and copied the text. The language that the documents were written in was Latin, and Latin was the language that was really spoken. Um, during this time period. So therefore, it was really only the people involved in the church, the hierarchy, that could read um, the language that these documents, the, that the Bible was written in. And so the followers really had to rely on their interpretation. Now, just going back to the Roman Catholic Church and that hierarchy, that organization, it was really modeled after the old Roman government. And as I told you, each member of the clergy had a rank. So I'm gonna go through this and I want you to rewind it as you need to, to get this down. But it started at the top was the Pope. All right, he was the supreme head of the church. Next came the Cardinals, they assisted the Pope and they were appointed, they were picked by the Pope. Next came the Archbishop, and he oversaw very large areas known as archdiocese. And I'll talk about this more when we're together. Below them were the bishops who governed what were called dioceses. And within each diocese was a parish that served was served by a priest and a parish is like a church. And of course, I'll parallel it like I paralleled um, the hierarchy of government. Um, the Pope would be like, um, well, we'll make him like a governor again. Okay, but even bigger, all right? He has more, more land to cover. So maybe all of the United States, he's kind of in charge of spreading the religion. And then he had his cardinals that helped him do that among, so that right there, those are his, his senators, his house of representatives that help him. Um, and he picks those, but he picks those people. Then, um, those then they had the archbishops and let's say those were probably like the governors and they oversaw the archdiocese which would be like the states very large area then within that state there's cities right so you have the bishops and the bishops governed the different cities but within each city there was one church or one parish and the person in charge of that parish was the priest okay that's kind of how i Try to parallel it in in terms we understand now now we actually do have dioceses um under the catholic church like there's an orange county uh archdiocese and then within those within orange county there's different dioceses and then there are parishes or churches 
So it still exists today um, in the Catholic Church. And then, of course, you know that um, the, the fact that the church definitely had a lot of power, of course, increasing power when King Henry tried to uh, tried to um, attempt to take power from the Pope and the Pope didn't like that very much. So with that power, though, also came money because there would be something called a tithe, which is a tax. So if you were part of the Roman Catholic Church, you would give a tithe or a tithing to the church, um, which added to the church's wealth. So so this was not just they, the church's economic and political power continued to increase as the power of the church's hierarchy continued to grow and the church continued to grow. And even now today, churches will ask for a tithe and it's kind of your, it's your donation to the church to help them keep going. Now, um, I talked about with you about the sacraments and there were seven sacraments that were set essential to gaining salvation. And they marked the most important occasions in a person's life. I'm not going to go over all seven right here, but we'll go over those when we do talk. You're not going to know, need to know each individual one for the test. Um, but some of them that were, um, were going through communion, um, were getting married, um, and um, even when you die, um, having the Eucharist or the blessing, um, among other things. Those were the sacraments. Um, these were the things that really affected daily life in mid medieval Europe. Salvation, we talked about, just like King Henry saying, okay, I would rather go to heaven than have all the power. Um, the church taught that in order to gain salvation, people had to follow the church's teachings and live a moral life. And if you didn't do so, your soul would be condemned to eternal suffering. That's no good. Um, and pilgrimages, this was another part of most of Christians' uh, lives during the Middle Ages. They hoped at some point to travel to the holy city. And these were, this was difficult, you know, really took dedication. They had to cover long distances um, and they, travel was dangerous and difficult. And no, you couldn't just hop on United and buy, you know, a business class ticket and get there, you know, get there by plane and take an Uber. Didn't happen that way. Much more difficult. Okay, Crusades. And you know, this is a biggie. They were those military expeditions to the land where Jesus had lived which Christians called the holy city. Um, to recover Jerusalem and other holy sites from the Muslims, um, the Christians started these, started the first crusade. People went on these crusades to seek wealth or adventure or to guarantee their salvation or just to satisfy a deep religious feeling. Not all of them went on these military expeditions to take over the land necessarily, um, but it was definitely um, part of the plan. Um, and there were several crusades. I think if I can remember correctly, there were actually nine crusades, but the ones that you might primarily learn about are the first three crusades, and we'll talk about those um, when we meet in person. Now, um, there were some things in this chapter they talked about that the Roman Catholic Church had influenced. It influenced art and architecture. Um, it influenced education um, and also philosophy. So when it comes to art and architecture, most of the art was made for religious purposes. Painting, sculptures were placed in churches. Um, to really help teach religious stories, especially like the stained glass. Um, those were stories from the Bible, because remember, people couldn't read. And everything, even holiday, everything that was celebrated um, was revolved around religion. As for the architecture, really beautiful, the cathedrals. Maybe of you have traveled and seen these cathedrals, but the, the arches, the gargoyles, the stained glass, the, you know, these huge, immense interior structures or spaces, arches, all of that um, had to do with the cathedrals. The education, um, the Roman Catholic Church influenced this because by 
basically educating the clergy. They were the ones that were most likely to get to be educated. And most of the schooling took place in those monasteries with the monks and the convents for, you know, um, for the nuns, the nunneries, and in cathedrals. Eventually, though, um, the cathedrals kind of influenced universities. Now, philosophy. Um, this was the, the teachings of this, primarily this one particular ancient philosopher, Thomas Aquinas. And we bring him up because he brought the idea of reason to kind of ancient philosophy and the faith of Christian theology with this concept called natural law. So he really tried to bridge the gap between reason and, um, and religion, saying that we as people, we don't need to be told that you have to be a good person. You, you naturally know by natural law, meaning we know within us what's good and bad. And we don't need to have the kind of the fear of not living an eternal life to, to know what those good things are. We can have both reason and faith. We can have faith that there is a God and that we're gonna go to heaven, but we can also have reason to understand that we do these things, not just for that reason, because, but because it's the right thing to do. So that was Thomas Aquinas's philosophy. And um, we see that philosophy more and more as we get into the, the Renaissance and the Reformation. Um, as I, as I made, I did make a statement that, um, about the monks and the nuns earlier that lived in these monasteries or nunneries, but you should know that they take a vow when they're there. And that vow is poverty. So they will live poor. They do not need to go get rich. They will never get married and basically obedience, obedience to the church. And they spent most of their days, you know, in prayer, study, work as i told you before um, they copied the religious texts they also attended up to eight church services a day almost like meditation um, they would they would attend these church services but they also cared for sick people poor people um, and they they really dedicated their life to the church and then separate we talked about but the mendicants which are very much like the monks and the nuns, but they didn't live in the monastery. They did the same thing. They vowed a life of poverty, um, obedience, um, but they didn't seclude themselves. They traveled among ordinary people to preach and to care for the poor and the sick. Let's see. And I think that's all I have for you. Wow, I think I got it all in. Okay, so we will meet and talk more about um, these um, different, uh, about the different crusades and about um, Thomas Aquinas, the Italian philosopher, um, and, and more coming up on Thursday. Nope, Friday, Friday when we chat. Okay, thanks for listening. I know this was a long one. I suggest rewinding and taking notes.